So I now call the reciprocal discipline matter of Inri Alexander Bedner, but a cause number 62368. I'll take announcements and appearances actually from the parties again. Judith DeBerry for the admission of, for lawyer discipline. And Gaines West for uh, Mr. Bednar. Mr. Bednar is also joining us um, via Zoom without his video on. Thank you very much, Mr. West. Mr. West, during docket call, you had said you wanted to be able to, to, to have a record. And so related to procedurally, there's a couple ways we can do so. Since we've denied the motion for continuance, we can take it up as a preliminary matter and, and you can re-urge it right now and, and make that argument. Or I can call the case and be able to have the commission put the evidence on and, and you can respond. Tell me how you would like to proceed. I would like to go ahead and respond, uh, or uh, actually I'd like to go ahead and make my argument on the motion now before the case is presented. So what we'll, we'll, we'll say for the record is that the board had received the fourth motion for continuance last night at 6 p.m. Um, we discussed in DACA call, but I'll say so again in terms of how we're having these recordings that the board has denied the fourth request for continuance and will issue a motion. During DACA call, you wished to be able to put some arguments on the record. Um, and you, uh, again, at this point, have asked a chance to do so. And so I'm allowing you to do so now, sir. Go ahead. And actually, um, uh, let me correct a couple of things. Mr. Gonzalez, uh, that was filed at 4.59 PM last night uh, with uh, the Board Disciplinary Appeals uh, a minute before the close of business um, of yesterday's business day. Uh, in addition, um, I would like uh, this record to accompany uh, this proceeding. So my argument actually should be heard first after you have called the case. I don't, I prefer that it not be relegated to docket call status. I believe that these arguments deal with the specific issues on this case. So I would ask you to call the case and then hear me on my motion, please, sir. I thought I did. That's why I repeated at, at the beginning of this hearing to, to reiterate what I did from DACA call. So we're, we're in the case. I'm sorry, it was confusing to me and your uh, description of how you wanted me to address. I wanted to be sure that uh, my uh, statements on behalf of my client are uh, on the record as the docket has been called in this case and we're appearing uh, in the matter as has been called. Is that correct? Yes, sir. I'm sorry if I, I did something confusing. That was my, my intent was to repeat that at the beginning so it wasn't on docket call for precisely what you're saying now. So hopefully right. we're on the same page. All right. Thank you. I think so. Uh, well, thank you. Um, and thank you for hearing me on my uh, objections and motion to strike orders um, dated January um, 8th, January 22nd, and January 28th. And to reconsider uh, as a full board uh, for uh, whether it's the fourth time or the third time or the fifth time to reconsider and have the majority of the board uh, decide that the denial of my client's motion for continuance is unlawful, uh, it is illegal. Uh, you certainly have the power to do what you are doing because the Supreme Court has given you the imprimatur to be able to make orders like this, but what you cannot do is violate my client's due process rights or discriminate him against him uh, in accordance with both federal and state laws. And we believe that's what you are doing. There was an unopposed request made pro se by my client that was filed on October the 16th of 2020. He asked two things in that particular filing. He asked that the respondent, and I'm quoting, hereby request an extension of time to respond and find counsel to represent him in the matter. Two things were, were asked for. It was styled unopposed motion for extension of time to respond, and it was styled in that manner because <laughs> Uh, the Chief Disciplinary Counsel, represented by Ms. DeBerry, had no opposition to that. Following 
uh, that filing, uh, there was an, an order that was entered by you, Mr. Chair, uh, dated October the 20th. And in that order, uh, it did two things as well. Uh, first, it was styled, and I'm reading, order granting respondents unopposed motion for extension of time to respond. And then within the body of it, in the order that you signed, Mr. Gonzalez, it states the board grants respondents unopposed motion for extension of time to respond and orders the case will be reset for hearing on the earlier of Friday, January 29th, 2021 at 9 a.m. or within 14 days after respondent becomes authorized to practice law in Texas, having been reinstated from administrative uh, suspension. <clears throat> Nowhere in this order does it set a date certain for a response to be filed by my client, nor does it state a date certain for a date by when my client must hire an attorney or find an attorney to represent him. Yet inexplicably in your order that you signed then, Mr. Gonzalez, on January the 8th of 2021, you state, and I quote, by order issued October 20th, 2020, the board reset the hearing from October 23rd, 2020 to January 29th, 2020, allowing respondent an extension of time to seek counsel and prepare his case. And I quote again, but that order, you say, did not extend the answer deadline. There is no basis for that statement in your order. Mr. You West, made that same statement if twice I more. Can I interrupt you for just a second? I have a question. Is it your position that Mr. Bednar intended to ask for an extension of his answer date in his October motion? Not that he intended, he did. Are you aware that he admitted at our pretrial hearing that he didn't even know he had an answer date at the time he filed that motion? At your pretrial hearing, he had filed an answer the day before. Correct, but he told us that he wasn't aware at the time he filed the original motion that he had an answer date. So my question is how could he have intended to ask for an extension if he didn't know he had the deadline? You know, um, Ms. Henson, I believe it is, I believe the documents are clear in this case. And I believe by the very act that my client filed the answer the day before you say the questioning occurred, moots that issue because there was an answer on file well within the time period which he could have filed an answer which openly would have been prior to today which he did it several weeks prior to today but well, instead of, let me let me make one more point Ms. Henson, let me ask one more thing well, Mr. West let me let me follow up with Ms. Henson because when the problem is obviously Ms. Henson and I and, and Mr. Ogden were in that meeting with Mr. Bedner and, and the problem is you you weren't and so when when Mr. Bedner says to us I appreciate the initial extension I was under the impression that one could simply present defenses such as the lack of notice or opportunity to be heard without having to file an answer and now I went back through the rules and realized that perhaps maybe I should file an answer. So I guess my question to you is when what we've heard explicitly is that was not intended as an answer, how is it now an answer? It is an answer and that was argument by a pro se client. I was not there to represent him, he had no representation. And what I was about to tell Ms. Henson is what I'm going to argue to you, Mr. Gonzalez, is that, you know, I had the great privilege that Supreme Court gave me of serving on this august body for 11 years, uh, from its inception through 2003. One of the things that I think the Board of Disciplinary Appeals must, should, and must consider is the harm to the citizens of the state of Texas and potential clients and current clients of lawyers. I fear this board has lost that goal. 
there is no harm to the citizens of the state of Texas for a potential client to be represented by my client. Um, there has been a cry made to you uh, for disability and your response is no, we are not gonna listen to that cry for disability. It's a shame we are at this crossroads having a, a person who has asked through his counsel to consider a disability when we have even the chief disciplinary counsel taking no position in response to this motion for continuance. And in fact, ask you as a board, the majority of this board to consider testing of my client for disability. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I believe that you are violating the law. I believe you are discriminating against my client and you are, are tracking all over his uh, due process rights in violation of the United States Constitution, the Texas Constitution, and the due course of law. He should not have to go to the Supreme Court of Texas to make this right, to have the time after I came into this case, I was, a week ago, I was hired in this case. I made my first pleading in this case to you on Wednesday. I contacted um, your general counsel and deputy counsel along with, with the CDC's lawyer on Tuesday, this, as soon as I could after I was, was retained, I filed my motion for continuance. In it, we made a plea for disability. And you know what our response has been so far? Nothing. Shame on us as a bar. We have been working hard to work with those in our communities who believe they may have disabilities. For this body to respond in this way is shameful. Mr. West, let me ask you, what authority, what's the basis for BOTA having authority to initiate a disability proceeding or to refer a matter to a disciplinary committee? Under, under um, uh, Title 12, uh, we have discussed our disability issues. Now, I will grant you, Ms. Henson, that uh, there is no grievance on file in Texas against uh, this particular respondent. But surely our rules allow you who have original jurisdiction to determine disability issues to refer a reciprocal respondent to either a district disability committee or to order testing yourself. For you to take the position you don't have that ability or authority puts a reciprocal discipline respondent in a less protected role than a respondent who's had a grievance <clears throat> filed against him or her in the state of Texas. That would truly be a sad day if that is the position of the Board of Disciplinary Appeals. Even if a grievance were um, proceeding, Mr. West, what authority does the board have to refer a matter to a disability committee? My the board, has, it has, it the has, board has every authority, Ms. Henson, as a uh, having the original jurisdiction for disability proceedings, it has the inherent authority to refer anyone for testing or refer them to a disability uh, committee. Uh, I will uh, challenge you uh, to take that role and to take that step. Uh, the only body that could tell you you didn't would be the Supreme Court of the state of Texas. I would dare say that the Supreme Court of the state of Texas would tell you you had no authority in your ultimate discretion to refer anyone for disability testing or to a disability committee. Well, Mr. West, I want to make it clear um, to, to you, just you know, on the record, so you're cognizant of this, is that this is not something that we took lightly. This is not something that we took flippantly. This is something that we actually researched and looked at to see what applicable authority we have with that. Make no mistake, I understand the issues, concerns that you're saying regard your client, regarding coming in, regarding the rep representation and where you've come from regarding this and possible issues. But at the same time, we're as held to the law as anybody else with that as well. And we weren't able to do so. I understand what you're saying. You're saying, hey, wait a minute. You know, there has to be some sort of leeway given to the fact of what's happening here regarding this based on the law 
and how the, you know, someone reciprocates <clears throat> compared to someone who's actually a member here. But what we're saying to you is that we couldn't find our ability to our authority in the law to do that. And I think that that's something that has to be, I wanted to make clear to you. This is not something that we just took flippantly and went lightly on, that we actually, it's something we discussed and researched on. And I appreciate that. And, I, and please forgive me, I'm not trying to shame this board for not taking this matter seriously. I'm just saying shame on us all for being at this crossroads uh, because if you really wanted to determine whether you have a legal duty and obligation, I think you could ask for briefing for that. Um, there is, again, there is no harm out there waiting in the state of Texas. There's no reason for your rush to justice today to say that there isn't time to determine this issue because as we all know, as good lawyers know, there's opposite sides to every uh, issue and there may certainly be one on this, but I gave you plenty of law dealing with the Americans with Disabilities Act, the Attorney General and its application of the ADA on these issues. And uh, knowing that for you then to simply say, oh, we've, we've looked at this, we've taken all of the legal uh, decisions and have researched that and come up with this decision. I'm sorry, I just have to challenge you and say that's fairly hollow when it comes to a cry for help. And your response is no. Mr. West, I am not as familiar with 49 other states, but I understand in your motion that your argument is that Texas is the leader in this area. Texas has attempted to be the leader in this area. Yes, they have. So in a reciprocal discipline map, I will, I will tell you, here is my hesitation. That means every other state that comes to us, then Texas shouldn't follow. We, we essentially just say our process is the best for mental health. And if no one else has as good of a process as we do, then really we don't recognize any other state's reciprocal discipline. Wouldn't that be the eventual problem we'd find ourselves in? I don't think so, Mr. Gonzalez. And I think if you carried your theory or reasoning to its logical conclusion, when we have disabled, ill lawyers, um, I think you have to, in your own conscience, decide and vote on what is the most important uh, procedure and proceedings or is it stepping back and saying, we're gonna uh, be informed scientifically by a mental health care provider, whether we're dealing with an ill lawyer or whether we're dealing with someone who can face the consequences of actions, not only in another state, but our state. So yes, I hope we will always be the leader in being able to say, yes, we want testing. Yes, we wanna follow scientific, um, uh, input uh, from mental health care providers so that, um, uh, yes, I, I think Texas ought to be leading that way. Mr. I West, have a question. to make sure Ms. Seibert got the record, there was a, there was a small, I, I, there was a small interruption. Ms. Seibert, did you get, okay. I apologize for the interruption. Mr. Gregory. Uh, my question is, are you wanting to determine your client's ability, mental ability now or at the time of the Oklahoma hearing? Uh, both, uh, Mr. Gregory, uh, because in 2013, um, and that would go to some of the defenses that uh, 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 your order and your chair has prevented us from being able to bring before the board. But in 2013, there was an issue of my client's disability there was also um, an issue of my client's disability that was brought up in his later issues with Oklahoma. Uh, they asked for those uh, issues to be brought uh, to them. He refused to do, do so because of privacy concerns. And so, yes, it's, we would both use uh, those disability issues. So what happened at the time uh, in Oklahoma in both of those proceedings and also here? Uh, because as, as you well know, Mr. Gregory and others on the board, our disciplinary rules uh, allow for 
uh, an ill attorney to be treated to the point where he or she then can be rehabilitated to come back and stand before this board uh, on these allegations and offer appropriate defenses. What's happened here is there is a rush to some form of justice for some reason that I can't figure out because there is no harm out there to be occasioned in the state of Texas. And this rush to justice is trampling on my, my client's constitutional rights as well as being discriminated against because of the Americans with Disabilities Act protections. So I think your actions are gonna be judged from here on out on those standards, not whether you care for him, whether you have good feelings about him, whether you care about disability issues or whether you don't. Your judgment is going to be uh, looked at and decided on whether you followed the law, whether you did something illegal today and discriminated against my client. And what my motions have done is to, to demonstrate quite clearly that you cannot hide you will be found out for discriminating against my client and for trampling on his, um, uh, uh, his rights as the uh, Constitution and Texas guarantees as far as due process. I'm not saying you intend to do it. I'm not saying you're bad people. I know you're good people. I served with a bunch of good people for a lot of years. So I am not, uh, I, I'm not um, uh, in trying to scold you in some way. I'm just simply saying we have a total 100%, 180 degree different disagreement on how to handle this case and it has been presented to you. And that's what we do in the law. Sometimes we disagree and I, I respect you for the position you're taking, I, but I do think it's shameful that we were at this crossroads and having to make these arguments, particularly when the chief disciplinary counsel, the representative of the commission lawyer discipline had no position on this and in fact encouraged you to order testing. May I respond, Mr. Gonzalez? So I, I, I would, and, and let me do one thing just to make sure that I, I am I'm doing what Mr. West asked. So one of the things I wanted to do, Mr. West, is to make sure that you have gotten to say what you wanted to related to that motion. And I, I haven't. I still have things I need to say. So, so to the extent that, that Mr. Barry is, is, is wishing, if you're not concluded, then yes, Mr. Barry, you, you may respond because I think you were asked right now to, uh, or at least the commission's words were, were being said as to what should happen. And so I think it's appropriate at this point for you to, to chime in. Go ahead. I, I would like uh, Mr. Gonzalez to be able to complete my statement. I think she can hold that thought until I've completed my argument uh, because that's not normally what we do is we go back and forth during our argument. Fine. You may proceed, Mr. West. Thank you, I appreciate that. What I was saying was nowhere in this order does it set a date certain for a response to be filed by my client nor for him to find an attorney. That's when Ms. Henson asked me that question about the answer. Again, an answer was filed in this case. That is what the record reveals. It was filed the day before the pretrial order on January the 8th. And Mr. Gonzalez, you're correct. I was not there. He did not have counsel advising him. His arguments made their pro se don't change the record that you have before you. Now, your succeeding orders attempted, Rest, I said. Mr. Russ, excuse me, I, I have just, you, you brought up pro se again. Your client had been practicing law for 17 years, is that correct? Uh, yes, and but he was not a licensed attorney in Texas during the time that he was representing himself before you. Okay. But I just wanted to make clear, yeah, he's been practicing 17 years. Okay, that's, thank you. Yeah, he was practicing in, in Oklahoma. Uh, he was administratively suspended in Texas, so he had no ability to appear before you as an attorney in Texas. Still, he is not an attorney in Texas because he doesn't have his license. He's been administratively suspended. And um, he, um, um, 
uh, I know the order that Mr. Gonzalez gave put a requirement on him to let you know if he was uh, restored, had those uh, license rights restored. Uh, he hasn't done that. And I think if you recall in our motions, uh, we said that he would be willing to not represent anyone in Texas during this period of continuance, should it be granted to them. Does that answer your question, sir? Yeah, I was just making clear. And I think that it seemed, if I recall in the record too, he had been practicing, just like you said, during this time period, he has not been practicing in Texas, but he had been licensed in Texas for about 16 years as well. I think 17 Oklahoma, 16 in Texas prior to this um, road suspension. Okay. Prior to that, yes. Yes, you're absolutely correct. The, um, the requirement that we believe this board should take into consideration is that he does have due process rights and those due process rights can't be simply swept aside by a statement in an order that says, um, uh, I, I never maybe intended to extend uh, the answer deadline, but Mr. Gonzalez, that's not what your order said. Your order said it did not extend the answer deadline and if a close examination of your October the 20th order, that's just not accurate. It's not correct. And even if you say it three times in your succeeding <laughs> orders, it still doesn't make it correct. Um, I'm also concerned about your uh, January 8th order because you introduced for the first time that um, they I apologize. <laughs> the hazards have been at home just a minute. I'll put her out. Excuse me just a minute. Ms. Seibert, did you get that for the record? The dog barking? Wolf, yes. Woof, woof, woof. Right. I did. I mean, let me encourage you that I know Ms. Seibert, and she was our court reporter way back when, and she was always able to get dog barks even then. <laughs> I apologize. That she, I can't catch her, so... It, it, it doesn't bother me. I, I love dogs, Mr. Gonzalez. I didn't mean to interrupt, Mr. Rice. Please proceed. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, what I was saying, Mr. Gonzalez, was that I noted in your order of January the 8th that you made reference to the fact that under your internal rules, 7.03, that you have discretion to allow something that you quoted as testimony from respondent relating to merits of the petition. I will note that your internal rules have no um, definition of what that, that uh, uh, offer uh, relates to. And frankly, I, I don't know what it could possibly relate to when you have denied my client a, um, his defenses, his statutory defenses under the rules um, under 9.04. Uh, it's like being invited to a knife fight and say, but you can't bring your knife. Um, the, the fact is once you have trampled on my client's due process rights unconstitutionally and discriminated against him under the Americans with Disabilities Act, you have left him nothing to be able to support any kind of testimony relating to the merits of this petition because this petition is ultimately without merit and if he can't show by way of defenses how it is without merit it's a <laughs> non <nonsensical laughs> offer in our estimation um, the um <clears throat> what we're asking is that you strike the orders reconsider and strike the orders of january 8th January 22nd and January 28th and allow my client a continuance to prepare his defenses pursuant to 9.04 of the disciplinary rules of procedure to go forward today to put a burden on my client to attack the merits 
of the CDC's position, petition is simply nonsensical and you can't deny my client his statutory rights in so doing. My client also has a right to counsel. This is a professional death penalty case. Uh, if you disbar him today, he is no longer capable of uh, paying his administrative fines and, and getting his license back. He is done for professionally in Texas. This is a death penalty professionally for him. That's why we have to balance the harm in the state of Texas. What is the harm in allowing him after retaining an attorney during a time period which there was, there was no prescription against him when he was to hire that attorney, what harm is there to any citizen in the state of Texas to allow me, his attorney, the opportunity to develop his case and his defenses? Um, the fact that you have decided to meet in a, on a quarterly basis is totally up to you. You could set this hearing at any time after a reasonable period, after 30 days um, and come back and we'd be able to um, uh, uh, present our case under these defenses. Um, the, the, the fact is the standard you are held to as a board is to consider and weigh these issues, weigh the issues of the respondent's rights, his legal rights or her rights, and the potential harm that could happen to a citizen of the state of Texas who's either been represented or could be represented by this lawyer. Looking at that view, there really is no harm to be considered because he is not a practicing lawyer currently and he is offered to this board to not practice until this decision is made final. Uh, as to my client's request for disability testing, I made this request for the first time in my motion for continuance filed just two days ago. Nowhere, uh, Mr. Chairman, was my request even acknowledged in your order denying my motion yesterday or today. Now, I haven't received your written order today. Obviously, you just made it. Uh, but so far, we have nothing in writing acknowledging this cry for help. We in Texas, I'm proud to say, have not, and we work towards not punishing people who are ill. We don't carry out the professional death penalty when other avenues for protecting the public are available. In Texas, we haven't done this and we shouldn't say no to cries for help. Your order yesterday denying my continuance acted as if no cry for help had been made. The Americans with Disability Act won't let you pretend he didn't cry out to Boda. On page 12 of my motion to strike, you'll find that the ADA will not allow this board to do what it has done. If you'll, let me refer you briefly in my motion to address the issues facing persons with disabilities, the ADA expressly prohibits state governmental entities, including state bars under the judicial branch of state government from discriminating against persons with disabilities and from excluding persons from participation in services, programs, or activities. But you say, well, Mr. West, that has nothing to do with what we're doing. Well, yes, it does. And let me explain to you why. Pursuant to congressional directive, which I gave you the citation to, the United States Attorney General has promulgated regulations that apply to attorney licensure by state bars, saying a public entity may not administer a licensing or certification program in a manner that subjects qualified individuals with disabilities to discrimination on the basis of disability, nor may a public entity establish requirements for the programs or activities of licenses or certified entities that subject qualified individuals with disabilities or to discrimination on the basis of disability. We don't know 
if Mr. Bednar is a disabled person. We want to find out and you should want to help us find that out. There is no harm to allow my client to proceed at a continued hearing with representation, me representing him. I have not been, been given time to represent him, to prepare his defenses. I was retained a week ago. Mr. Gonzalez, in your order of October the 20th, you, gave, you granted his request to not only file an answer later, but also to find an attorney later. And you didn't put any deadline on him other than today. He met that deadline. He filed his answer. He hired me in time, in your time. There is no harm in vacating these orders of January the 8th, the 22nd, and 28th. And there is no harm to the citizens of the state of Texas in allowing testing that has been requested. Again, shame on us all as warriors in the state of Texas that we find ourselves at this crossroads. We shouldn't be here. The motion for continuance should have been granted out of hand. It should have been granted in a way that preserve the dignity and respect of all people involved in this process. I am more concerned about Mr. Bednar and his health than I am about this board being able to tell Oklahoma or any other state that it likes or doesn't like what they did. You should be too. That concludes my statement concerning the denial of our, my motions for continuance and my denial of my request that you strike these three orders of January 8th, January 22nd, January 28th. And now I guess I will add the order that you announced this morning on January 29th. Thank you, Mr. Gonzalez. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. West. Mr. West, I, I might have muddied things up by calling it a motion for reconsideration rather than what you I, were I can't hear you, sir. Can you hear me now? I, I can't hear you. I have you now. I can hear you, Mr. Gonzalez. I might have made things unclear. Let me first make sure you can hear me. Yes by calling it a motion or, or saying that you wanted to submit a presentation, if you do so, then we just proceed. Um, or alternatively, Ms. DeBerry speaks. What I'm inclined to do is, is to listen to Ms. DeBerry and then take a break, put, put you and Ms. DeBerry in a breakout room, take up the matter as a board, and then reconvene. Are you amenable That's to fine. that? Okay. Ms. DeBerry? Yes, sir. I am. Okay. Ms. DeBerry? Okay. I'm <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Gonzalez. I have several things. Um, first of all, I want to address... Um, I'm not hearing her. I'm not hearing her. <clears throat> okay. Am I not loud enough? I can hear you just yeah, fine. We can hear, can hear you. I, I... Okay. Mr. West, it may be your speaker if everyone else can hear us. I, I, I have okay, no problem with my speaker. <clears throat> okay. Um, first of all, I object to um, the mischaracterization um, that Mr. West um, provided this board saying that I agreed that Mr. Bednar needed to be tested. That's not what I said. What I said was if they granted the continuance, uh, for that reason, I would prefer testing over going to the disability committee first. That's mainly for expeditious reasons because then we would know um, whether it would even be appropriate. But there again, I agree with the board's position that they really don't have the authority at this time based on our rules to refer this to the Disability Commission uh, Committee. Mr. Um, West made the misrepresentation that Oklahoma in his pleading does not have a procedure for dealing with impaired attorneys. That's simply not the case. They there are rules governing disciplinary procedures, Oklahoma statute title 
5, Chapter 1, Appendix 1A, specifically lays out in Rule 10 the suspension for persons in capacity to practice law. That includes people with mental health issues, people with um, addiction issues, whatever. They have a procedure for that. They also have a procedure very similar to ours. Is when that disability is over, it can be the suspension can be removed. And just like here, they still face discipline for the misconduct that may have occurred during that time. Now, Mr. Bednor, by Mr. West's own admissions, had the opportunity in Oklahoma to present that evidence if he thought he was disabled or had a mental health issue. He did not do that. I'm concerned that through all of this, Mr. West, it's just speculation that he has a mental health issue. He's given us nothing to say what type of issue that is, what Mr. Bednar has done or hasn't done to address the issue, if, it, if there is an e, even is one. So we have no evidence before us at all that Mr. Bednar has any kind of mental health issue, any disability at all, except for Mr. Gaines' speculation to such. Um, <clears throat> therefore, I don't think because he a prior opportunity to do that in Oklahoma and the nature of reciprocal discipline is we don't question what they did there. If he chose not to take advantage of that in case he did have a disability, that's on him. That's not for this board and for Texas to try to rectify. That's not our job here. That's not the purpose of this, of a reciprocal discipline. The other thing I would note is in Mr. Bednar's first, regardless of what he titled his first motion for continuance or extension of time, when you get to the prayer, he specifically asked for an extension of time to prepare, to prepare his defense and continue to seek counsel. Nothing in there says anything about a time to answer. Nothing in his prayer says anything about a time to answer. The order that was given by this board then simply repeats the title of Mr. Bednar's motion. It doesn't say that they're giving him time to respond. It simply repeats the title of that motion in the, in the order. Um, I don't know if I've got all the points or not. I think Mr. Mateo made my point I was going to make uh, when Mr. Uh, Wes said that he wasn't licensed in Texas because Mr. Bednar was licensed in Texas. He simply wasn't authorized to practice law here at this time. And all he had to do was pay the, the, uh, the fees and he could have practiced. So that's not, that's not an issue. Um, there again, I don't, I, just to reiterate, I, Mr. Bednar had plenty of time. He waited until the last minute to get counsel he had four months total from the time he received notice of these proceedings. Um, and I respectfully request that this board go ahead and hear this matter. Mr. Berry, this is Michael Gross. A couple of questions yes. for you. Sure. When you reviewed the, uh, the Oklahoma proceedings, did you see anything in there from CDC's perspective that made you believe there was a disability problem with this individual? I did not. Now, um, no. Did any of the... Mr. Mr. West's representation that they asked him about a prior problem he'd had, I guess, in 2013, and he refused to give them any information. Did any of the individuals on the disciplinary committee in Oklahoma express any concerns about Mr. Bednar's uh, potential disabilities? Not in the documents we have. Now, I do not have a transcript of that hearing. When was the first time you had a conversation with Mr. West? Real roughly. How long ago? About a couple of days ago. Okay. Before, he called me and told me he was going to file something that he'd just been hired. And that may have been uh, Friday at the earliest, I believe. Mr. West. Could it was on there. Tuesday, Tuesday of this week. I'm, I'm speaking to Mr. 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 Berry and Mr. West. Sorry. Uh, Mr. Okay. Okay. No. Berry, yeah. Mr. Berry, um, when did Mr. West tell you he had been retained by Mr. Bednar? I'm not real sure because Mr. Bednar called me and started talking and said he had retained Mr. West. And that may have been Friday. And I said, then I can't talk to you about this. 
Um, and maybe, you know, if Gaines says it was Tuesday, it was Tuesday. I know it was this week. It's been within a week. And what is your position on whether or not the continuance should be granted, Mr. Barry? I think Mr. Bednar has had plenty of time. Um, and I think the hearing should go forward. Do you think Mr. West has had time to get affidavits from individuals who have seen any potential disability suffered by Mr. Bednar to present to us today? He hasn't even told us what Mr. Bednard's supposed disability is. It's just a speculation on his part. I don't know. I mean, if he did, he certainly could have called him and had him fax something. Has Mr. West offered to provide you affidavits from individuals that could attest to any disabilities they see has, as lay people of Mr. Bednar? He has not. And not only that, Mr. Bednar, when he submitted all his um, exhibits to this board, and I can, I can find the exact, I think it was one of the later exhibits that was in his, his stack, provided a doctor's, and I, don't, I did not print all of it out because it was massive. Um, I do have a list of his exhibits. Um, he had a statement from a physician saying that um, exhibit number 96 was Dr. Lewis's proof of mental health fitness. I, I, you, you, broke up, you broke up just a little bit there, Mr. Barry. Could you, could you repeat that again on sure. exhibit, exhibit 96? Was Mr. Bednar? I, 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 I would object, first of all. Excuse um, me. I'm sorry. Excuse me. Uh, I'm so there's sorry. There's a HIPAA violation. I've asked for protective orders. Mr. Bednar, Mr. Bednar, you, you have counsel. Please, your counsel has said that he did not want you speaking. Go ahead, Mr. The, Barry. The, the, he has. I will, uh, hold on, hold on, hold on. I will assert that HIPAA objection, and I would ask that all documents, um, Ms. DeBerry agreed with my client before I came on board to seal all exhibits and witness lists. Many of the documents are from seal proceedings in Oklahoma. Um, uh, we have sitting judges uh, in Oklahoma that are concerned about retaliation. And so we're asking that all of these matters be sealed. And I know the purpose of this hearing is to have uh, issues uh, video recorded and then open to the public. And so uh, I think it's important that my clients' um, rights, uh, privacy rights, uh, be um, uh, absolutely observed in this proceeding. So I object to Ms. DeBerry's uh, response to Mr. Gross's um, uh, questions. Uh, and and uh, I'm not saying she can't respond. It's just that if we can agree that any responses would be uh, blocked out of any uh, video reproduction of this uh, hearing. Once so, again, once hold, again, hold, Mr. Hold, hold, hold on. <laughs> There's an objection. Let, let, me, let me get some rulings real quick. Mr. West, let me first clarify. I think your client, Mr. Bedner, spoke up to object. So let me get some clarification. At the beginning of this proceeding, you said that you were not gonna call him and he was not going to participate. Tell me now, do I listen to his objections or yours? Obviously mine. Okay, so I will let you confer with Mr. Bedner related to his participation in this proceeding when we go into a break. Uh, because if we're gonna listen to you, then I, it's just not appropriate for him to then object. Do you agree? Certainly, and what I was going to do was let Ms. DeBerry respond to Mr. Gross's question. I didn't want to cut off her ability to answer. And then I was going to assert the objection so that we could carry the issue of confidentiality forward. So that's why, uh, and I'm sure my client was very concerned about information going out, but this is a videotaped uh, proceeding which we could uh, care for, um, you know, confidences after the, the matter. And I now he just didn't aware of that. Okay. Second, I am mindful that for the past hour, you have spoken on this public video about your client's disability. Um, so, so saying if there's any kind of HIPAA violation, it seems to be that the commission's position <laughs> that there's a lack of one, 
Um, that would be certainly less harmful to any privacy rights than your insistence for the past 30 minutes that he has one. Hold on, let me just finish up. I I'm also aware that 96 potential exhibits were filed by Mr. Bednar in this matter. And that my understanding is the CDC did not have objections. And I'm glad you're bringing this up because part of my question is whether you wanted to include all 96 exhibits as an offer of proof for us to review as to the merits of the petition. At this point, what I will do is overrule your objection, but simultaneously instruct Mr. Berry not to, to, to use the name of any physician, but she might respond generally to Mr. Gross as to what her position is as it pertains to this stability, because you're the person that's raised that issue. So it's difficult for me to say that you can raise that issue of disability, but then she can't respond under the idea that there's a HIPAA privilege. So your objection is overruled, yet Mr. Berry is instructed not to, to reveal any specific diagnosis or name of any doctor that at some point uh, might cause a concern. Mr. Gonzalez, you, Mr. Gonzalez. I, I just, Mr. Gonzalez, just for the record, I need to be able to say and ask you to reconsider that ruling for this reason. The disability reference that I made refers to the rights that my client has to be protected from discrimination. The, uh, uh, this is not a disability proceeding. This is not, you are not acting as a disability committee. Um, uh, uh, for Mr. Gross to then question Ms. DeBerry about disability issues, whether this client is disabled enough to be considered as disabled for purposes of our rules is entirely highly irregular because all our requirement is to do is to raise the issue of disability. I can't be questioned as to whether I believe he's disabled. I'm not a mental health care professional. I have not had time to have a man who lives in Oklahoma travel to Texas or in Oklahoma to be able to get an affidavit from some health care provider in a few days, much less get an appointment. And then thirdly, I do need to make one thing clear to the board. Yesterday afternoon, Mr. Bednar's father suffered a stroke in South Carolina. Your actions do have consequences. Mr. Bednar would be on an airplane this morning going to South Carolina to be with his father. His father is in a hospital in South Carolina without him because he's having to be here. Uh, hopefully his father will recover. <clears throat> he's an elderly man, he's had a stroke, they're concerned about his arteries being, you know, totally clogged. And so um, uh, the, the intimation that we haven't done everything we possibly can do before today through Mr. Gross's questions is offensive and highly unusual because all we're doing <clears throat> is asserting that we have a disability issue, a cry for help. The response shouldn't be, you haven't shown us that you're disabled enough for us to act. The response should be, let's get some medical testimony concerning his disability to talk about this ill person if he is ill. And if he's not, then we go forward with the hearing. This, again, what is the rush to justice here? There is no reason for this rush to justice. Mr. Mr. Wait, wait, Mr. Rust, I want to make it clear for the record right here. I do not believe we've been aware or cognizant whatsoever regarding any issues regarding um, Mr. Bedner's father whatsoever. This is the first we're hearing about this. So any sort of insinuation whatsoever that um, we're being callous or anything else regarding that aspect or anything in this personal life, I mean, in all, in all sincerity, Mr. West, I think that's, that's offensive. I understand the argument that you're saying, hey, listen, I haven't had time. I believe that there's some sort of disability, et cetera. That's fair. But to, to, to go on to that launch and to speak about, hey, wait a minute, his father's sick. What's going on here? You have consequences regarding this. I, I find that highly offensive. And I apologize. It was not intended to offend you or any member of the board. I didn't want to have to bring that up. But since Mr. Gross started asking the questions of whether my client is disabled enough to consider this disability issue, then 
we're going into another area of concern. And I thought it was appropriate to bring up the issue uh, that just happened this uh, yesterday afternoon concerning his father, which makes it very difficult for him and for me to be able to proceed with this matter. Mr. Gross, you were asking a question and Mr. Barry, there was an objection. I ruled on the objection. Please continue. Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead, Mr. Barry, Exhibit please. Number 96 is a doctor's uh, note, letter, whatever, uh, that Mr. Bednar offered for proof of his mental fitness. So for that, there again, you know, he's the same situation that we're in. Number one, and I'd just like to say this. Again, Mr. West has misrepresented my words. I never agreed or said anything about sealing any of the documents. That is a total misrepresentation of anything that has ever been said. It's never even been discussed, never. Um, we, the only thing we discussed was the possibility of one person who didn't want to testify publicly what I told Mr. Bednar and I told Mr. West was the only time I knew that had been done by the board was then when there was an undercover peace officer testifying who was still undercover. That's the extent of any discussions regarding that. I also find it highly irregular, Mr. West, that you would make a claim of disability in a reciprocal proceeding, especially when Oklahoma has which you misrepresented to this board, they have a procedure for dealing with disabilities. Their procedure, as well as ours, does not take away the misconduct. When a disability is removed in both those proceedings, then the discipline action continues. So it just stays at if there is one, which I, you know, we've had all this, he's disabled, he's disabled. We have nothing but speculation on Mr. West's part, Mr. Bednar says he's, his mental health is fine to practice. So we have nothing to go on except an empty speculation thrown out by Mr. West. Um, <clears throat> so at this time, I'm gonna respectfully request that this proceeding um, continue and that the board consider the reciprocal to discipline. Mr. West, a uh, quick question for you, if I could, sir. This is Mike yes, Gross. Yes, um, I, um, I'm curious why, I'm curious about the timing of your pleadings yesterday. Um, I understand you were recently retained. I completely understand that. Um, my question is why you waited until late yesterday to make that filing? Well, I didn't have the order on the January 28th filing until almost uh, 10 30 in the morning yesterday i had i had other matters i was attending to and uh as soon as i cleared those matters i began the motion and um and filed that motion as early as i could trying to get it filed before the close of business day it took me most of the afternoon to get that accomplished why uh, did you not include in that pleading mr well, west indications about the stroke of mr bednar's relative well, uh, there's, uh, I didn't feel like that was pertinent or germane to these proceedings unless we had to bring that issue before the board. And uh, it now is before the board. I, I feel like I'm in a darned if you do, darned if you don't position. If, if no. I brought it up, it would have been viewed <clears throat> as an, an effort to get a continuance that had already been denied uh, three times. And so um, that was a personal matter with Mr. Bednar. And uh, w we weren't trying to, um, you know, uh, spike the ball, so to speak, in, in this uh, body and say, you need to uh, move this to another day because of these personal issues. I simply brought that to your attention once you started asking questions, Mr. Gross, about whether you believe that my client was disabled enough, uh, you know, and, and I can I can respond to Ms. DeBerry that uh, the Oklahoma did have a concern for my client's uh, mental health. They just didn't bring it under their uh, appropriate disability procedure, which is which is different than ours. 
And on that point, minute, Mr. West, if, if I could ask you a quick question on that point, sir, can you point us to anything in the Oklahoma record that indicates a competency question or a disability issue that yes. should have been latched on to by yes. the Oklahoma Disciplinary Committee? Uh, not only the Oklahoma Disciplinary Committee, but this board and um, Ms. DeBerry, their second amended petition for reciprocal discipline in cause number 622368. Um, uh, I'm sorry, that was our second amended petition here. And I believe it, well, I don't have the whole petition here, but Oklahoma did have a concern for his, um, um, uh, let's see if it's in this, hang on just a second, let me read this. I'm sorry, I don't have the whole petition for me. I believe it's someplace in, in the Oklahoma's petition. Uh, maybe it's in exhibit three, just, to, uh, just a second, hold on. Ah, here it is. It's in um, 2019, Oklahoma 12, um, page 11. The bar explained in this correspondence that it sought this information based on a concern that respondents physical and or mental health might again be affecting his practice of law. That's on page 11. That was filed uh, in the Oklahoma proceeding, proceeding for bar discipline. I think that answers your question, Mr. Gross. Because the last question for you, Mr. West, um, why in your pleadings did you not attach statements from lay people, coworkers, neighbors, family or whatever, that could spell out concerns they have about Mr. Bednar, whatever disability it is that might be. I, I didn't have that, nor did I have time to communicate or talk with any of his neighbors or lay people. And besides, a, a lay person's view of whether someone is disabled is hardly evidence. You need scientific, uh, a mental health care provider to be able to tell you that um, uh, someone is disabled. Uh, you needn't have anything more than me, his counsel uh, telling you that I am concerned based on my representation without uh, 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 breaching attorney-client privilege um, uh, that I have a concern that he needs to be tested. You should uh, have to not go any further than that. As a matter of fact, I'm concerned that uh, any kind of lay testimony or lay communication would simply just be viewed as self-serving and something that, uh, you know, shouldn't move the needle one way or the other, because what needs to happen is not my uh, speculation, as Ms. DeBerry put it, or my concerns, which I think is a better way to put it, rather than attacking me, uh, uh, I think what needs to happen when this happens, when a cry is made, is a response that says, let's have this person examined. I'm not trying to get him off the hook or off the problem that he is in but, uh, from reciprocal discipline because he may be ill. I'm simply trying to say it's time to find out whether he is now like Oklahoma said then, they were concerned. They specifically made that statement. The bar that wasn't claimed. a healthcare professional that made that statement, right? No, it, it wasn't a healthcare So you would agree, would you agree with us, with me that lay people would have seen signs of his disability and you could have gotten statements from those lay people? No, you, I don't you agree, agree with that. that. No, I so, don't agree So his that. disability is invisible to lay people? No, that that's not what I'm saying either. Okay. I, I find it offensive to, for you to have that line of questioning concerning a very serious issue uh, because I think we should be about, uh, and, and, and I know we've had task force and commissions in the state of Texas dealing with mental health issues. And for you to suggest that someone can be seen or observed uh, to have a mental health issue and a disability, and if he doesn't, and if he's not seen or, or heard by lay people to believe that he's not disabled, I'm sorry, Mr. Gross, I think that's a throwback to a time that we don't need to go back to. So do you think, Mr. West, your intemperate language today is being of any help to your client? You know, um, 
I am an advocate for my client, Mr. Gross. I'm sorry that you apparently believe that it's intemperate. Uh, I am an advocate for my client's position, and I'm very concerned about him and concerned about this case. If I've offended you, please accept my apology. You have that not at all. Not, my not at all. It's just my observation. Mr. West, thank I you, thank Mr. you Gross. for your responses to my questions. Sir. You're welcome, Mr. Gross. There's a motion for reconsideration of our ruling this morning that is pending before the board. We will take that matter up. It is at 1030. We'll go off the record. Ms. Truitt, would you please, let's reconvene at, at uh, 1045 with the parties. The board will be in recess at this time. Before we go back on the record, I just want to make sure Mr. Gaines can hear us. He's flipping in and out. Yes, I can hear you fine. Great. We'll go back on the record in clause number 62368, Henry Alexander Bedner. In response to respondents' request for reconsideration, the board has convened on bonk and has upheld the same motion denying the continuance and the requests as stated earlier. The board also notes um, that we appreciate the spirited advocacy. Um, we are not offended by, by very passionate and strong beliefs, um, but certainly think that going forward, we can tone the temperature down a bit if it's all possible. We're all practicing lawyers um, and all advocates and so certainly respect that. So, Mr. Gonzalez, this, if I could say, um, I, I apologize if I offended the board or anyone on the board. Um, I have been working very hard since I was retained on this matter day and night uh, to try to represent my client uh, adequately um, and um, uh, passionately because I, I fear that I was the last person uh, between him and health issues. And when, when that is the juncture that an attorney um, finds himself uh, in, then it requires some passion. So I, I apologize to those who may have been offended. It was simply my uh, willingness to uh, have that passion for this client and to discharge my duty as a zealous um, advocate for him. You don't need to apologize. And that's why I wanted to begin by saying we're, we all play advocacy roles. And, and we've been, we know we've been in our role before. So, Thank you. One thing I wanted to clarify um, as we are going to proceed with the merits at this point is, Mr. West, with your permission, what, what I'd like to do is, is incorporate everything that you said and not just pigeonhole it in the issue of just your motion for reconsideration, because it seems like it went to, to, to much of the merits of what you said. So yes. I don't think we're, we're curtailing that. I think all the same things that you've addressed truly apply to some of your objections to this proceeding as well as to why, um, yes. is, that, is that accurate? Yes, it is. And thank you for the record to reflect that so that um, obviously, as you have uh, surmised, um, um, with an action of this board to disbar my client, then you leave us the only option that we have left is to seek review of your orders. And so it's important that my record be as clear as it possibly can be. Yes, sir. With that ruling, uh, petitioner, the commission, you may proceed. Thank you. I place the board. And Your Honor, uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Gonzalez. The only thing I, I would, one other thing I would say is, is that um, we we would object uh, to the presentation of the case because we believe it is not in my client's best interest from a health standpoint. First, first of all, first and foremost, and for the reasons that I've previously stated, uh, based on uh, his due process protections. Again, I, I make that statement only for the record. I want to make sure I don't waive it at any point. And uh, since Ms. DeBerry was about to get into the actual presentation of her um, 
uh, claims. I wanted to make sure that the record's clear that I've done everything I could possibly do uh, before uh, that time in order to preserve our record. Thank you, Mr. Gonzalez. Yes, sir. Your objection is overruled. Thank you, Mr. Gonzalez. Now, if I can proceed uninterrupted, please. This is a reciprocal disciplinary action brought pursuant to part nine of the Texas Rules of Disciplinary Procedure based on respondents' professional misconduct and disbarment in the state of Oklahoma. The commission's second amended petition for reciprocal discipline was filed with FOTA on October the 30th, 2020. The order to show cause was issued by the board on September the 15th, 2020, requiring the respondent to show cause within 30 days of the order why identical discipline should not be imposed in Texas. The respondent was served by certified mail return receipt requested on September the 19th, 2020, with the second amended petition in order to show cause. The original certified mail receipt and green card was filed with the board on October the 13th, 2020. On January the 11th, 2018, a complaint was filed with the Supreme Court of the State of Oklahoma in the matter styled State of Oklahoma XREL Oklahoma Bar Association Complainant versus Alexander Luis Bednar, respondent OBAD number pound sign 2166 SCBD pound sign 6618. On or about June 1st of 2018, a trial panel report was filed with the Supreme Court of the State of Oklahoma before the, the Professional Responsibility Tribunal in State of Oklahoma, XREL, Oklahoma Bar Association complainant versus Alexander Lewis Bednar, respondent SCBAD, pound sign 6618, finding that respondent is disbarred. On or about April 29th, 2019, an order was issued by the Supreme Court of the State of Oklahoma denying respondents motion for rehearing. And on May the 31st, 2019, another order was issued in the Supreme Court of the State of Oklahoma, striking respondents request to the Supreme Court to review and reconsider his case. In the proceedings for the bar discipline, the Professional Responsibility Tribunal found that Mr. Bednar did not respond to the complaint or to the bar's motion to deem allegations admitted. The tribunal did deem the allegations admitted, but, but after a two week trial, found that the record of disciplinary proceedings supported a finding upon clear and convincing evidence that respondent violated Oklahoma rules of professional conduct 1.1, 1.3, 3.1, 3.2, 3.3, 3.4, 4.2, 4.4a, 8.1b, 8.2a, 8.4c and d, and rules governing disciplinary procedure 1.3 and 5.2. Uh, during the hearing, Mr. Bednar was allowed to put on evidence, uh, witnesses, exhibits, and cross-examine witnesses. At this time, I'd like to offer the following exhibits. Exhibit number one is a certified copy of the complaint filed with the Supreme Court of the State of Oklahoma in the matter styled State of Oklahoma XREL, Oklahoma Bar Association Complainant versus Alexander Lewis Bednar, respondent OBAD, pound sign 2166, SCBD, pound sign 6618. Exhibit number two is a certified copy of the trial panel report entered in Oklahoma, in the Oklahoma Supreme Court. Um, State of Oklahoma, XREL, Oklahoma Bar Association, complainant versus Alexander Bednar, Lewis Bednar, I'm sorry, respondent SCBAD, pound sign 6618. Exhibit number three is a certified copy of the proceeding for bar discipline that was entered in the Supreme Court of Oklahoma in the same manner. Exhibit four is a certified copy of the order denying the respondent's motion for rehearing that was entered in the Oklahoma Supreme Court. And exhibit five is a certified order um, striking the request to review and reconsider that was entered by the Oklahoma Supreme Court in the same case. Exhibit six is the original certificate of Blake A. Hawthorne clerk of the Supreme Court of Texas dated January the 11th, 2021, which indicates the respondent is licensed but not currently authorized to practice law in the state of Texas. 
And exhibit seven is the prior discipline of respondent that was filed with the board on October the 15th, 2020. Um, at this time, I would request that these exhibits be admitted. Mr. West, do you have any objections? Yes, I do. <clears throat> the uh, uh, offer by um, Ms. DeBerry is, um, uh, should not be accepted by uh, the Board of Disciplinary Appeals because um, my client's uh, due process rights have not been observed. His answer has not been accepted by Boda. It was filed within the duly authorized period of time within which he was given to file an answer um, uh, with this board. Um, he has then been ruled by the chair in an order of this organization of the Board of Disciplinary Appeals uh, to not be able to bring any defenses um, to um, any of the um, matters that have been presented to the Board of Disciplinary Appeals. I think I said earlier, uh, maybe a little passionately, that it's like being invited to a knife fight without a knife. And uh, again, uh, here we are uh, at this juncture where um, we are um, uh, being asked to respond to documents that inappropriately should not be offered at this time because my client's due process rights have been violated and he is being discriminated against based on his rights pursuant to the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, and this board is failing to heed my cry for help, uh, seeking a, um, um, some kind of a mental health provider to examine uh, my client to see if he should stand uh, further uh, for these charges. For all of those reasons that I've well stated before uh, we got to this juncture, uh, we object to these offers. And those objections I will note for the record are to all seven exhibits, is that correct? That is correct. And are there any specific objections to any specific exhibit as to authenticity or reliability? I have no objections to authenticity or reliability. My objection is that they should not be received by this board because they are being offered in a process that is devoid of due process for my client. And my client has been not given an opportunity to uh, have his answer heard or be able to be heard on his defenses. Yes, sir. Based upon the board's prior rulings and your prior advocacy and consistent with our rulings, I will deny the objections to exhibits one through seven and admit petitioners objections, uh, uh, petitioners exhibits one through seven. Thank you, Mr. Gonzalez. At this time, the board seeks a uh, request that the board enter a disbarment uh, judgment as reciprocal discipline pursuant to part nine of the Texas Rules of Disciplinary Procedure. Thank you. Mr. West, you may proceed. Um, what I uh, will do is adopt the arguments that I have made uh, previously concerning uh, the uh, board taking up this matter uh, because uh, we have not been able uh, uh, to put on evidence and testimony that could have proved that the Chief Disciplinary Council's second amended petition is without merit. Um, I do want to clarify for the record um, the information that I provided in response to Mr. Gross's question earlier uh, so that I can uh, have it uh, clear for the record uh, uh, when he was asking Ms. DeBerry about the second amended or whether the, uh, the Chief Disciplinary Council knew of uh, whether Oklahoma had any idea of uh, my client's disability, potential disability. Uh, I referenced you to a document entitled 2019 OK-12 in the Supreme Court of the state of Oklahoma. And that was attached as exhibit three to Ms. DeBerry's <coughs> second amended petition that was filed with this board on September the 9th. So, uh, what I was, I didn't do a very good job of it, but I wanted to make sure the, the record was clear that what I was referring to was that in Ms. DeBerry's own filing in Exhibit 3, it references the Oklahoma's knowledge of 
the fact that they were concerned that respondents' physical and or mental health might again, might again, I might add, be affecting his practice of law. Um, we believe that uh, the board is outside of its uh, rulemaking authority to deny my client uh, to make his defenses. We have no idea what the chair or this board means in terms of the uh, language that it used hear testimony from respondent relating to the merits of the petition because the merits of the petition would throw us back into a presentation of the uh, defendant's defenses. Um, and um, we have uh, clearly been ruled uh, not to be able uh, to do that. Uh, so my client at this point, I will have him uh, state for the record uh, what his uh, involvement is in this uh, uh, proceeding. So Mr. Bednar, would you please state to the board what your involvement has to be in this proceeding? Wait, let me pause. Uh, Mr. West, hold on one second. Let, let, me, let me pause for one second. So, so uh, if you're, if you're going to call him, I need to put him under oath. Um, and, and second- Fine, you, you may do that. Okay. You mentioned at the beginning, um, and I want to clarify, at that point, then, he is a witness subject to cross-examination, correct? He is a witness subject to cross-examination, but you'll soon find that his uh, statement will clarify the extent to which he can uh, testify or will testify. I, I just wanted to clarify, because at the beginning of the proceeding, you said he wasn't going to participate. And so I didn't want to put us in a situation where he offers testimony and then there's a discrepancy or confusion as to him not being allowed to, to be asked questions. That's all. Yeah, yeah uh, I understand. <clears throat> it's a very fine line we have to draw because um, uh, I have to make him appear in this proceeding um, for fear that you would simply disbar him for not appearing in this proceeding. And uh, so I have to make his appearance on the record as a part of the record so that uh, I can point to the fact that he actually did appear in this proceeding as he was ordered to do. And uh, he has been here. So he will make this short brief statement for the, uh, the record. And then uh, he will take uh, any um, questions that you want to give him. And, and his response will be identical to the statement that he is going to give you. But if you will, uh, if you want to swear him in, feel free to do that. And Mr. Bednar, I would invite you to Go ahead and uh, um, uh, turn your video on. Mr. Bedner, would you raise your right hand, please? Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you give in this matter shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, sir. Mr. West, you may proceed. Um, Mr. Bednar, um, uh, would you please state to the board what your position is on any testimony uh, that you could give in response to uh, the petition and the exhibits that have been entered of the record today? Um, well, as my counsel previously stated on the record, uh, I believe that moving forward with the hearing today under constraints uh, arbitrarily set forth and placed upon me by the Board of Disciplinary Appeals violates my due process rights. Uh, consequently, to avoid the potential of waiving any of my rights, I will respectfully decline to answer any question or provide any statement. Thank you, Mr. Bednar. Uh, uh, Mr. Gonzalez, uh, as long as we, I have um, effectively adopted all of my argument from before Ms. Um, DeBerry's um, provision of the, um, of her case. Um, and I've adopted that in response to her case. And now we have Mr. Bednar's testimony. We have nothing further. Let me pause for one second because you tendered to witness and I think that witness is invoked. And I just want to see if Ms. DeBerry has a position on that as it relates to that witness who's not, Ms. Redden, you haven't been, been excused off the stand. If we were in court, you'd still be on the witness stand. So if I can ask you to keep your camera back on, please. Sure. Ms. DeBerry, 
the, the witness has, has invoked, uh, I don't know if the CDC has a position in terms of, of asking questions or, or seeking any leave at that point, or no, there's no questions. Council? My only, my only question to Mr. Bednar is, Mr. Bednar, who prepared the uh, statement that you just read? Trying to interject and ask you not to answer that question because it violates attorney-client privilege. Mr. Bednar, let me rephrase. Did you prepare the statement you just read? I'm going to ask that my client not answer that question because it's attempting to invade the attorney-client privilege. I will take that as an objection and I'll sustain your objection, Mr. Weston. Thank you. Okay. Anything, any other questions, questions Mr. No. Okay. So, uh, Mr. Bednar, you, you, are there any further questions, Mr. West, redirect? No, you're, no, no, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Bednar, you're now excused. You may turn your camera back off if you wish to follow in the proceedings. Thank you. I've got to call the hospital. Thanks. Mr. West, I, I know that you have, have rested and closed, um, but I have a question for you, and I'd, I'd like your advice. Prior to your involvement, Mr. Bednar submitted to the board 96 potential exhibits. And arguably, is in a situation we have invited and said by order that, that the transcripts of the Oklahoma proceedings can be introduced. Um, at this point, are you wishing or will you submit as an offer of proof the 96 exhibits or those transcripts for the board to review in addressing, as we say, the merits of the petition, which I agree with you under the internal rules. I, I, I wish I could tell you I knew what that meant either, um, which is why looking at the transcripts we thought might be the best way to address the merits of the petition. What's your position on the pre-filed exhibits and are you moving for those right now? Are there any due process concerns, I should say, in the fact that they've been pre-filed by January 20th, we have them, and simply they can be made part of the record or not. I think you could take official notice of those without me moving uh, them uh, on the record uh, that could possibly compromise a due process claim. So um, I would simply, uh, 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 you asked for, for my advice, I'm not gonna move them. I think the board, since they've been filed with the board could take official notice of them. So just for we have a clear record, what I note in, my, in, in the notes of the exhibits is 20, potential exhibit number 25 is a transcript of a pretrial conference. Potential exhibits 33 to 42 are the transcripts of the panel hearing. Hearing may be the wrong word, maybe the, hand, the, the panel fact-finding um, yeah. proceedings. And so absent objection from either party, the board will take judicial notice of exhibits 25 and 33 to 42. No, I have no objection. Members of the board, are there any other issues I haven't taken up or questions you have for either party? The only other question I would have, and I never got a ruling on um, I think it's important because of the sensitive nature of these issues that we seal this record um, and uh, seal the documents in this record because some of the documents you've taken official notice of were in sealed form. Uh, I don't have the exact page numbers or bait ranges, but uh, if I could work with Ms. Hodgkins or Mr. Greer, on those issues before they are being put in the public uh, domain. Uh, I would appreciate that um, possibility. I don't know how that works, I'll confess, um, but we'll take up that matter under advisement and certainly Thank we'll you. ask. To, to I think we should take notice of uh, exhibit 96 also. I would, I would appreciate that. Especially so, let me, let me be clear for the record. So of the potential exhibits, one of the ones referenced by Ms. DeBerry and her response to your uh, concerns about us as a board violating the ADA, as I see it, relate to the fact that my, my reading, and I'm not an employment lawyer, is that, that under the ADA, someone announces they have a disability and then you, you take an adverse action because of their disability. 
Uh, and I believe an argument was made that a potential exhibit that Mr. Bednar submitted um, might refute that. And I think Mr. Bednar objected um, even during the proceedings as to mentioning or discussing exhibit 96. So um, Mr. West, what's your position on potential exhibit number 96 that was submitted for this board's review by Mr. Bednar? Would you identify for me the contents of that exhibit, please? It is. It's a, it's a, it's a letter that Mr. Bednar submitted from a physician that attests to his, uh, I think, exceedingly capable ability to practice law. And that, um, I, I don't know what other medical information's in there, but that's the, that's the summary of it. And what's the date of that letter? I believe it's 2017. Okay. Yes. I, I would object to uh, the board taking notice of that letter for the purpose of the uh, notice and request that I gave this board concerning disability. This is a, the, the, uh, whether he had a disability in 2017 or as the Oklahoma board felt he may still have a disability when they referenced it in Ms. DeBerry's exhibit three in 2013 is of, of little consequence to the issue before the board concerning whether he should be adjudicated in for his disability presently. We're not really looking at whether he was disabled or not, other than the fact that it has some bearing on your determination of his disability or should have a, a determination of his disability status now. So uh, I would object to that because it's not relevant to the inquiry of this board uh, the Board of Disciplinary Appeals on the issue of reciprocal discipline now and the issue that I brought before this board concerning him being a disabled lawyer. So I think it is a red herring. I think it, it provides um, uh, the information that is not relevant to the um, discussions that and deliberations that this board will have. So I would ask that it not be uh, accepted as an exhibit and that the board not consider it further, it be stricken. May I, may I respond? Yes, you may, please. Thank you. Um, this was actually dated April 4th, 2017, which as Mr. Um, as Mr. West pointed out, and I'm, I'm sorry I'd forgotten that part of that one exhibit, um, was, during the time that the disciplinary proceedings were ongoing in Oklahoma. So I think it's relevant to um, the claim that whether or not he had any disability at that time um, and the reasons therefore, and I don't know why he offered that, but the other thing is I'm not even sure it's covered by HIPAA since he disclosed it. Um, it's not from the doctor, it's from Mr. Bednar. He claimed no HIPAA. Um, privileges when he disclosed it to Oklahoma or to us. Uh, and I would respectfully request that that be included in the record. Uh, and I would say, Mr. Gonzalez, it's also hearsay. And so uh, as hearsay, it would be excluded too. But more importantly, um, here we are in January the 29th, almost the last day of uh, January in 2021. And um, we, uh, we're gauging reciprocal discipline based on uh, this man currently. Uh, it's not, your view is not to determine was he disabled in Texas in 2017 or 2013. And so besides it being hearsay, besides it being um, a document that's not relevant to your current deliberation, um, I, I mean, it's, it's highly prejudicial. It is something that you shouldn't rely on because of its prejudicial character that to, uh, to sway this board in one direction or another. Um, what, is, what should be the focus, and as I've argued a lot about, uh, should be the focus is determining uh, whether or not Mr. Bednar is suffering from a disability currently. My, my cry for help has been, has fallen on deaf ears continually. 
But all I can do is can do to ask for that. And so I think by um, officially recognizing this document, it is um, uh, it would uh, unfairly prejudice uh, the uh, liberations. Uh, it's hearsay and it's not a reliable document uh, for the purposes I've outlined. Mr. West, as I understand it, you have accused the board of discriminating against Mr. Bednar based on his disability in our January 8th and 22nd orders. Isn't that right? Not only your January 8th and your 22nd Inclusive. order, but also your January 28th order and the order that you made this morning verbally. I understand that. But so wouldn't it be relevant to whether we discriminated based on a disability wouldn't it be relevant to know the information we had at that time about Mr. Bednar's mental health? Um, that's something you certainly can argue. I, I think that uh, you, your um, involvement in this matter and denial of my client's claim and cry for help um, uh, sufficiently I have a record on what this board has done in denying his due process. You don't need this document. Um, I don't need this document to show your denial of his uh, due process and your violation of the Americans with Disabilities Act as it's applied to the various states uh, uh, through the Attorney General of the United States. So uh, uh, while someone could argue it would be helpful, I, don't, I think it's too highly prejudicial. I think it's unreliable because it's hearsay. And so I think it, it should not be accepted as part of the record. And I would just respond that, um, I, you know, this is a board of lawyers. I think they can give it the weight it would give um, based on the information provided. I think it's relevant to the, as Mr. West pointed out, the um, part in the Supreme, in the exhibit three that talks about uh, the disability. The fact that Mr. West raised this issue, but has offered us no proof that of any disability from Mr. Bednar, except the reference in that one order, I think this is highly relevant. And I, again, respectfully request it be included. Thank you both. What I'm going to do is to weasel out of it and say that I will take the matter <laughs> under advisement because I, I want to research what that is. You made a hearsay objection, so I will. I want to be able to find out what to do uh, in this situation. And so part of taking the matter under advisement is whether or not in a written order um, we, we admit the document uh, or we don't. And then um, as, to the, as to what trial judges always say, as to the weight but not the admissibility and find out then at that point what weight, if any, it should be given. So, and- As to the hearsay objection, I would say it was offered by a party opponent He's the one that offered it. Okay, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Barry. Mr. West, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, the, the only other thing I, I wanted to offer is from a disability perspective, the board seems to be stuck on how disabled this man might be. And I hope that something that comes out of this proceeding eventually down the road is that we don't get into this kind of a crossroads issue again, so that if a disability is claimed that, uh, and there's no harm to be occasioned to the citizens of the state of Texas or to any clients, that we don't get into a discussion of how disabled <laughs> someone is or whether they're disabled based on lay testimony or whether some other state felt they were disabled or not, but rather I hope my, my desire is that this case will lead us to the point where when someone makes that claim that there will be a mental health care professional brought in to make that evaluation, ensuring that there is no harm to any citizen in the state of Texas in that period of time that's my goal, that's my hope, is that as we move past this and these deliberations, that when this confronts this board or any other board in the grievance governance system, that you will have a clear direction 
to say exactly what needs to be done. We disagree on, on what the board is doing. Uh, I will maintain that this is a very critical and important issue for jurisprudence in the state of Texas and how we treat warriors who present themselves where others believe they suffer from an illness. I think that's what our lawyer's creed requires us to do. I think that's what our state bar has been writing on and encouraging us all to do. I just find it very sad today we're departing from those aspirational goals. But I will do what I can do and you all do what you need to do. And I do appreciate and thank you all for your service to the state of Texas and to this board. I believe me, I know how hard a job this is. And I thank you for your attention uh, to the detail that I have presented to you. Thank you very much, Mr. West. Mr. Berry, anything yes. further from the commission? Not at this time, thank you. Then that concludes this matter. The board will take this case under advisement. Mr. West, Mr. Bedner, thank you for appearing. You are excused. Mr. Barry, if we could have you stay for one moment, I think there's one remaining matter on the docket. There it is. Thank you. Good day.